All right. Good morning. This is Senate Health and Welfare, and it is January 26th. Today, we're looking at some bills related to our mental health crisis and trying to uh, understand how we might improve what's going on out there with children, with families, with hospitals, with clinics, um, with providers with healthcare workers, mental health care workers generally. Uh, the, we've seen such an escalation in need for support services, counseling services, mental health beds. Our schools are in crisis around mental health. So today we're beginning that discussion. We have three bills. The first bill that we'll be looking at is a, a fairly benign workforce bill, a working group bill. Uh, but I'm, I'm very interested in listening to folks today. And our, our goal today, uh, committee, is really to take testimony and to hear what people have to say about the issues related to our mental health crisis and then the solutions that might um, be possible. This is the first day on these bills, and there will be other days that we can take testimony we will also be deciding how to deal with the issue, whether we integrate some of these ideas into a single bill or two bills or keep it as three. So we have a long way to go on this and we have some very um, informed and experienced folks with us this morning. And I look forward to that testimony very much. So we're going to begin with S197 as introduced, the committee's been through it uh, and we have a number of people here to testify. So we're going to begin <clears throat> uh, the morning. I'm not going to introduce the committee at this time. I think some of you are new to the committee, but uh, our names are all posted with our, with our, our, our pictures and uh, our, we'll, um, we'll just move ahead. So Ashley Miller is here, a pediatrician from South Royalton. So Ashley, welcome. I understand you're on a time crunch. Please introduce yourself for the committee and then we welcome your testimony. Thank you for having me, everyone. So as um, Senator Lyons said, I'm a pediatrician and owner of the South Royalton Health Center in South Royalton, Vermont. I've been practicing in the Upper Valley for about 15 years. Um, we also operate Health Hub, which is a school-based health center as our nonprofit um, bar. We serve 10 towns in Orange and Windsor County, um, providing medical, dental, and mental health services. In my clinic in South Royalton, I'm lucky to have co-located mental health. I have a counselor as well as a care manager. Um, so, um, and I have a psychiatrist who comes in two hours every month to consult with me about medication management. So overall, I feel very well supported and lucky compared to a lot of my colleagues. Um, but I'm here today to tell you a story about five patients um, and the impact they've had on me in the last six weeks. Um, as Senator Lyons said, since the pandemic, our mental health crises has really come to a boiling. Um, I used to do maybe 25% mental health in my clinic because I really enjoy mental health. Um, and since the pandemic, it's been 50 to 60% of my daily practice. So starting about six weeks ago, um, I had five patients uh, with fairly lethal suicide attempts. Um, the first patient I'm gonna tell you about presented to the ER before Christmas and boarded for two weeks in the ER awaiting a bed at the NFI hospital, which is a diversion program to help prevent um, serious mental health consequences. He didn't get a bed. And in those two weeks, he was deemed able to return home. His family no longer wanted him waiting in the ER room, literally empty, nothing that he could hurt himself with, a sitter, meaning an untrained person, trained to keep him safe, but no mental health training, sitting in his room, watching him 24 hours a day, not receiving counseling, not receiving psychiatric care, not even receiving PCP care for me. Um, so they went home after two weeks. Unfortunately, that same patient is back in the hospital again today after another serious lethal suicide attempt. When he was discharged, there was no follow-up with a psychiatrist or a counselor. He followed up with me. I voiced my concerns. We worked hard to get him into urgent psychiatric care. Um, luckily, his attempt was non-lethal this time, um, but it's very concerning to me that this is where we're at. So that was patient one. 
patient two was seen in the ER, probably spent 12, maybe 15 hours there after, again, another very serious attempt that could have been lethal. They were determined to be safe to return home with their family who assured the ER that they could keep them safe. And they were sent home with follow-up with BCP. Again, no psychiatrist, no counselor, just me. And I'm lucky, I can get my patients in the same day. I own my own practice, I make my own hours, my staff loves me, they'll stay for me, so I can get them in. Other PCPs aren't so lucky, they don't have the flexibility in their schedule. So it might be several days after this ER visit that that patient would be waiting to be seen by anyone. Patient number three was again seen in the ER. Unfortunately, this patient at only 13 needed chemical restraints because of serious attempts that continued in the ER. Because she needed chemical restraint, she was lucky enough to get admitted to the medical floor. Because she was on the medical floor, she could be seen by the child psychiatry doctors who came in and did a full diagnostic evaluation, diagnosed her with autism, and started her on the correct meds. She had been on a waiting list to see psychiatry for over 12 months. I had been managing her as her PCP, doing the best I could, and now she finally has the right medication and hopefully will do better. She will be discharged with follow-up with both the psychiatrist and myself and the plan for counseling at our local mental health center. This is where things get bad again. We have a wonderful system in Vermont. We have the infrastructure to provide excellent mental health care. We don't have the staff. The staff that we do have is often underqualified and they are all overwhelmed at two times capacity. So at our local community mental health centers, also known as designated agencies, things like Clara Martin Center, HCRS, Howard Center, the plan there is that they have wraparound intensive services that they can provide individual, family, group counseling, summer programs, respite care, intensive in-home behavioral therapies for parenting support, parenting interventions, um, as well as case management, that they can go into the schools and provide counseling, that they can do behavioral assessments in the schools and provide behavioral health there as well. Unfortunately, right now, one of my local community mental health centers has a six month waiting period for counseling. Six months. The other local community mental health center doesn't have a psychiatrist and they haven't in almost a year. So again, these patients end up back in our PCP care. We do the best we can, but we worry for them every day. The fourth patient was seen and admitted to Brattleboro Retreat. Again, another lucky patient. They're gonna get the care they need. Well, Brattleboro was so overwhelmed. They spent about 48 hours there. They saw a psychiatrist. They wrote in their discharge summary, some question diagnoses that they thought maybe this patient would have but they didn't spend enough time with them to feel comfortable in their diagnoses. They made some medication recommendations to me, again, sent the patient home with follow-up only with me, no counselor, no psychiatrist, follow up with your local community mental health center. And unfortunately, these discharge summaries, because the psychiatrists are so overworked and inpatient, take six to 10 days to get to me. So I've seen the patient. I don't know what the diagnosis was. I don't have a medication plan but I'm doing my best to help keep them safe as an outpatient. So the fifth patient was seen, and again, lucky, was admitted to NFI. So they spent five days there. They saw a psychiatrist, they had a diagnosis, they did some counseling, some group therapy, they developed a thorough safety plan that they went home with from there to use with their family. But again, no counselor, no psychiatrist, just me to provide follow-up. So again, this patient, I didn't have the discharge summary when I saw them. And unfortunately, I saw them, they were discharged on a Friday and I saw them on a Monday. Luckily, this patient felt comfortable enough with me to disclose over the weekend, they had returned to their binging disorder. They had binged and purged five times on Saturday and were again contemplating lethal suicide suicidal thoughts. Their parents didn't know. If I had known from their discharge that this was a concern, we would have gotten them in Friday. We would have put supports in place, not just around their physical safety, but their mental health over the weekend as well. 
So I don't say any of this to begrudge my colleagues who are working so hard in mental health to try and see all of these children and who are supporting us in every way possible, creating emergency consult clinics that we can call into as PCPs, trying to see our patients for one visit to help us with a diagnosis or a medication problem. But I tell you about these stories because I really think Vermont can do better. We have an amazing infrastructure, as I said. We just really need to put the time and effort into recruiting these providers, training these providers, providing accurate and um, reasonable payment for the services. I talked to a psych psychiatric nurse practitioner who had been practicing in pediatrics for 10 years out on the West Coast and who was looking to come back to the East Coast. I thought, ah, finally, I can have a psychiatrist in my office full time. This will be amazing. She took one look at what our insurers were paying for her time and her efforts and said she couldn't work in Vermont. So I feel like this is where we need to do better. We, we can be set up for success. I really appreciate all of you taking the time today to listen to my stories, and I hope we can do better. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Um, I, I have one question for you, and that is, you, you're talking about pediatric patients. You're, all five are pediatric patients of varying ages. Yeah, from 13 to 18. Um, and I've had one as young as eight who has had to go through these services as well. So. I hope that we can turn to a preventative model instead of a putting out fires and use these community mental health services at the beginning and not the end. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yes. Um, before I let you go, uh, uh, it would be extremely helpful if there, if you could get us a, a one pager uh, of your testimony and particular your recommendations for um, moving forward. That would be very helpful. I'm happy to. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Okay, and Senator Hardy has a question. It has to be quick because Doc, Dr. Miller. Sorry, is on I'm us, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, okay. We can discuss it as a committee. I thank you so much for your testimony, and I hear you on all of the the requests that you're making. My question is more that the bill that we're considering wouldn't solve any of the problems that you're laying out. So I'm I'm wondering. Um, Senator, I want that, to make sure we're solving the right problem with the right bill. <laughs> so, Senator, um, that is exactly why we're taking testimony so that we can take this bill and modify it so that it does begin to solve some problems. I, I completely understand what you're saying. It may be that there's a working group in it, it may be that there's not, and we will be working on finding solutions for the mental health crisis. So, as I have said before, this bill becomes a vehicle. And um, it may be one bill, it may be integrated with others. So we'll just continue to listen and figure out. Well, thank out you, Dr. Miller, for your testimony. No problem. And feel free to reach out to me if you have other questions in the future. I'm happy to be a resource. Thank, thank you. you. We will. Thanks. All right. Um, so next. Aaron, help me next on the list. Do we, we are moving past Emily Hawes and Allison Kromf at this time and moving on to Stephanie Winters of the Vermont Medical Society. That's correct. Thank you. Stephanie, welcome. Great, thank you so much. Um, Stephanie Winters, I am here today. I, I represent a number of groups, but I'm here today uh, on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics Vermont chapter, the Vermont Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, Stephanie, Stephanie, your your uh, your audio is in a tunnel and it's echoing. Is there a way that you can? Is this better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Yep. I had to turn off my space heater so that you could hear me. <laughs> it's a little cool in my house today. Oh, okay. Um, so Stephanie Winters, I'm here on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics Vermont chapter, the Vermont Academy of Family Physicians, the Vermont Medical Society, and the Vermont Psychiatric Association on S197. Um, and I'm here to speak in support of that. Um, I, as you all know, and as you just heard from Dr. Miller, uh, our mental health system is in crisis. Uh, Vermont is not alone. But as Dr. Miller said, we can and should do better. There are many organizations and individuals doing amazing work to come up with solutions to improve mental health for and of Vermonters. 
but we cannot do this in silos. We must work together to leverage existing resources and come up with innovative, innovative solutions. Any sustainable improvements must happen in a coordinated effort with the right voices at the table. So if we do move forward with this work group, we would urge that the representatives include a primary care physician and a psychiatrist whom um, we would be happy to name. A comprehensive and multifaceted approach must include short-term strategies to alleviate the current acute boarding crisis, as well as longer-term interventions designed to support the growing need for mental health services, both inside and outside the hospital setting. We're pleased to see that the governor's recommended budget includes a proposal to expand mobile response units and urge the legislature to appropriate funding to do so, as well as to support more statewide alternatives to emergency departments, such as uh, pedi pediatric urgent care for kids and NPAS units. In speaking about coordinated mental health crisis response, I'd be remiss if I didn't include a few actionable things we could do in the short term that could make a large difference in the lives of Vermonters. So as you heard from Dr. Miller, um, much like mental health, primary care is in crisis and you're gonna hear more about primary care hopefully in the days and weeks to come. Um, but they are the backbone of our healthcare system and patients trust their primary care office. And we know that a high percentage of visits include mental health. One way to improve access to mental health care and support primary care is the integration of mental health services into primary care. There are a number of ways to do this and Dr. Ashley um, described her model um, and we would hope that this was expanded throughout the state, but a model that has shown great promise and utilizes existing workforce, which is really important uh, when we, we hear about the inability to get more workforce in the state, but a model utilizing existing workforce is a collaborative care model or child psychiatry access program. The collaborative care team in this model is led by the patient's existing primary care provider and gives the primary care office and patients access to support from behavioral health care managers, psychiatrists, and frequently other mental health professionals and allows patients to receive high quality psychiatric care in their medical home, their primary care office. A pediatric collaborative care model has received um, HRSA grant funding to launch in Vermont. Unfortunately, ongoing reimbursement for this model is not paid for by Vermont insurers. And there are a group of codes that would provide payment for these services. So we would propose that all Vermont health insurers, payers, including the Department of Vermont Health Access and commercial insurers turn on and provide payment for these codes. And I've provided in my testimony a list of those codes. Um, and really what we, what we see is this would be a support um, to Dr. Ashley, uh, who's doing a lot of these things on her own. It would also relieve some of the burdens from a lot of the other mental health agencies. Again, we support the creation of the Coordinated Mental Health Crisis Response Working Group and we look forward to participating. Okay, thank you very much. I, as I look at your testimony, I see that you have a distinction between uh, the insurance codes for providers and the codes that are utilized at FQHCs. It, it, what, is, there a, is there a monetary difference between? No, okay. No, it's just there are different codes for FQHCs because of their reimbursement model. Got it, yeah, the PPS. All right, thank you. That's helpful. Um, any questions of clarification committee? All right, um, thank you for that. The, you've given us a lot of things to think about going forward. Okay. Senator Hooker. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, for being here and testifying. My question has to do with availability of, of providers and how that, you know, I certainly understand the need for the collaboration. Um, do we have enough providers and how can we uh, address that in the short term? So. so I think that's a great question. We always need more. Um, we always need more providers, practitioners. We need more psychiatrists. Um, 
we need more primary care. What I will say is there's already people interested in doing this. And actually very timely, I got an, an email from a pediatric office this morning who said, we're trying the collaborative care model with Dr. Strokoff, who's a, a psychiatrist who's working on this model in the state. Um, it's been useful, except um, we, you know, we need him more. We can only really see him once a month. So it's not as helpful as it would be. And we really can't even cover that because we don't, we're, we're not reimbursed. We're not paid for his time, for our time. And so it's, um, they can't, you know, they're a small independent practice. They can't afford that. So I think there are, there are already existing practitioners who want to do this, who, who would love to be able to do this. Um, and they can't. So do we need more? Yes. But can we implement something now that would really make a big difference? I believe we can. Okay. I, I have one other question. Um, as you're talking about access once a month, uh, is how much of this access, for, uh, for, is it your understanding that there is telemedicine involved? And would that in any way improve uh, access. Are you talking specifically in the collaborative care model? Senator yes. Lance? yes. So yeah, I think there's different models. I think um, there's phone consultation, there's video consultation. Sometimes the psychiatrist is brought in with the patient. Um, there's a behavioral health care manager. I have a great graphic I can send you. It kind of shows this flow chart of people and how they interact. Um, and again, there's lots of different models. This is one that I think this is one of the, the more generalized ones. So yes, I think telemedicine is certainly phone call, video, um, sometimes in person if it needs to be referral, certainly. Um, so there's lots of different ways to do that, but yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. We're beginning to get a picture. <laughs> um, so we'll move on to Devin Green. Devin, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And I do have written testimony that I will be providing to you right after this. We just needed to get the latest statistics. So I wasn't able to get it to you beforehand, but <laughs> What I can tell you is that this Monday on January 24th, we had 37 people waiting in Vermont emergency departments for mental health placement. Over 70% were waiting more than 24 hours and 10 people have been waiting for more than a week. In a system where we strive to move people in hours, we consistently have people waiting days for placement and this is not the right care at the right time or place. Over the last several months, we typically have 30 to 40 patients waiting for mental health placement. Total hours waiting for mental health placement have increased since we started measuring in May 2021. Over half on any given day have been waiting more than 24 hours. Most are waiting for inpatient admission. While COVID has severely limited inpatient and community capacity in Vermont, wait times for mental health placement are not unique to COVID. The volume and wait times for people seeking care through Vermont's emergency departments have continually increased in the years since Tropical Storm Irene. And I'll say that one of the things that I learned in the COVID crisis, I was talking to some of the ethicists during um, COVID to talk, to talk about crisis standards of care and um, how to allocate resources to individuals when we have scarce resources. And one of the ethicists mentioned, you know, now that I think of it, I think we've been in crisis standards of care in Vermont for mental health for a long time now, for many years, just because we have people waiting in the emergency departments for these long times in these extreme circumstances. So VAS supports all efforts to improve initial response to individuals in mental health crisis, and more therapeutic alternatives to the emergency department and peer supports for patients, um, as well as statewide telepsych. I didn't know I didn't know we'd be looking at all the options today. Basically, we support all of them. I think statewide telepsych would also help um, in terms of getting that care in the emergency department that 
um, that we heard was not happening necessarily right now. Um, so that's another thing that we support. In terms of S197, we think <clears throat> this work group is a good idea and it's good timing right now with the 988 National Suicide Prevention Lifeline going live on July 16, 2022. We think that there's a lot that can be done in terms of coordinating that initial response to a crisis um, and making sure that the default is not to just automatically send people to the emergency department, but to ensure that they get the right care at the right time and the right place. Um, in addition to the important goals of this group, Vaz would ask that the committee have the group consider a rare but devastating situation, which is when a patient assaults one or more uh, healthcare workers and are taken to court, but then they're ordered by the judge to return to the same emergency department while waiting for inpatient treatment. So this is not to say that mental health patients are inherently violent. They are not inherently violent. In fact, they are more likely to have violence enacted against them. But anyone who's been waiting in an emergency department for days or weeks at a time, um, is in an emotionally volatile situation. And so there are times where assaults happen. Um, and sometimes those people are taken away and put in front of the judge. And the judge says that they um, need inpatient treatment and they are brought back to that same emergency department with the same staff. And that staff needs to care for someone who has just assaulted them or their colleague. Now, that's not, that's not helpful to the patient. It's too much to ask for that staff. And it's just because we have a gap in the system in terms of resources for these types of situations. And so we would ask that the work group consider that situation as well and consider um, a solution for it because it's completely unacceptable for both patient and staff. And so we support S197. I can also speak to the other bills, but uh, at this point in time, we definitely support the work group and greater coordination uh, to ensure right care at right place and right time. Okay, thank you. So what I'm hearing you say, and it sort of resonates with what uh, Dr. Miller said earlier is we have an in infrastructure, but it isn't coordinated and we don't have the people to fill the slots. It's, this is the frustration, I think, that's driving the conversation completely. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think everything needs to be bolstered infrastructure, coordination. Like I said, I think um, we need more resources across the mental health care continuum. We've been in crisis for a long time at this point. Yes. Um, yes. I was, uh, I, I've been on the, uh, the board for AHEC, and uh, I remember years and years ago when we were talking about trying to find additional child psychiatrists for the state. It's not; it's a never-ending problem. If you have uh, your testimony in writing, that would be great. And then, uh, and for each person who does testify, uh, highlighting your suggestions for moving forward. If there some direction that could be given to a workforce, a task force, working group, <laughs> uh, or some concrete solutions that we can put into statute that would be helpful. Uh, so thank you. Right. And you just want me to speak to S197 right now, right? At this point, and we will, I'm going to put you at the top of the list when we get to 195. I know you're also on a time crunch. Great, thanks. Yeah, okay. Um, so Morning Fox is here. Morning, thank you for being here. Uh, you, we are familiar with you in your in your old position, but maybe you could inter introduce yourself for the record, and then uh, we'll listen to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Morning Fox, uh, Director of Mental Health Programs for the Department of Public Safety. <clears throat> uh, so I've, I've been intrigued listening to some of the testimony uh, earlier today, uh, and uh, uh, none of it comes as a surprise to me. You know, as you mentioned, uh, Senator Lyons, uh, due to my prior role with the Department of Mental Health uh, as the deputy commissioner there for the last four and a half years, uh, 
it's it's very apparent, uh, just as Devin Green said, uh, that the uh, the system needs uh, resources in uh, multiple places throughout the system. Uh, I think Dr. Miller uh, examples of uh, the cases that Dr. Miller presented, as well as uh, some of the information from Stephanie Winters in talking about access to psychiatry. Uh, uh, in essence, workforce uh, development issues, uh, as well as uh, tele telehealth uh, was brought up, um, and uh, and the idea and the concepts of uh, expanding uh, uh, psychiatry and mental health services integration in primary care offices are all uh, extremely important uh, pieces, uh, as well as. Um, the ongoing uh, devastating information that you hear from uh, from Vaz with the uh, number of people waiting uh, and the wait times uh, and such. And I'm well aware, uh, as the committee knows, of uh, of of how how strenuous that is on the individuals who are uh, stuck in those situations, as well as for the providers uh, and the system as a whole. Um, and speaking specifically about uh, S197 and how it was uh, brought to my attention uh, in looking at developing a, a coordinated response, if you will, uh, to people in crisis. I think what we're looking at here in some of the conversations, uh, if I may be, may be so bold, is that we're looking at several kind of um, um, tendrils, if you will, uh, from from a, a single piece here. Um, as you know now that my work is with the Department of Public Safety, so my I was kind of given two charges when uh, the commissioner brought me on uh, to the Department of Public Safety. Uh, so before I get to those two charges, the one thing I just want to point out as well is that for the Department of Public Safety, this is an extremely important uh, area. Uh, uh, the Vermont State Police and Department of Public Safety have been working on modern, modern, modernizing uh, law enforcement and how uh, Vermont State Police uh, respond to individuals uh, who are having a crisis. I tend to try to stay away from uh, describing folks as having a mental health crisis per se. Uh, I, I prefer just the term that people are having a crisis uh, because we could be talking about uh, addictions, we could be talking about age-related uh, issues, dementia and Alzheimer's, uh, traumatic brain injuries, uh, et cetera. And so really what we're talking about is people who are having a crisis because of something going on in their life um, that they don't have kind of the, the ability and, and, and whatnot from a, a cognitive perspective to manage that stress in kind of societally uh, accepted ways uh, and in safe, safe ways. Uh, and so the Department of Public Safety is extremely committed to uh, continuing this work. One, the example is they created my position uh, in order to do it. I am the first position within the Department of Public Safety to be a mental health professional, to be uh, really overseeing all the mental health. It seems weird to, to say this, the mental health work in state police and in the Department of Public Safety. But as you have heard uh, over the years, uh, People will talk about how law enforcement is uh, uh, the first frontline responders uh, for people in mental, you know, who are having a crisis. Um, and you have heard for for a long time that law enforcement uh, will kind of look around, going, "We're not social workers. We didn't go to school for social work or for psychiatry or psychology, uh, and, and yet we rely on law enforcement." Uh, to do much of the work uh, at times um, with uh, uh, when it comes to someone having a crisis out in the community. Uh, law enforcement is frequently asked to uh, go to people's homes to do welfare checks and determine if people are safe and things of this sort. Uh, and that we're uh, expecting these, these to happen uh, with law enforcement that have, you know, really minimal training. That's not the bulk of their training is to do mental health assessments uh, and, and such. And so uh, really looking at how we in the Department of Public Safety and how law enforcement in general respond to people in crisis is one of the charges that the commissioner tasked me with. Uh, getting back to those two tasks that the commissioner uh, asked me to take on uh, when 
developing this position and bringing me uh, into the Department of Public Safety. One is uh, that the state police, uh, with uh, collaboration with Department of Mental Health and the DA system, uh, designated agency system, uh, have started embedding mental health workers within all the state police barracks. When I took over uh, in the beginning of September here, uh, we had about four uh, mental health crisis specialists in the barracks. Uh, as of last week, we were up to nine. Uh, and uh, we're finishing up some interviews and hopefully we will be having a mental health crisis specialists in each barrack um, in, in short notice. The other piece of my charge was to help lead the Department of Public Safety in envisioning an alternative response uh, to people who are experiencing a crisis in the community that has come to the attention of law enforcement, uh, generally through a call to 911 or something of that sort, uh, and how we can develop an alternative response that doesn't necessarily include an armed law enforcement response uh, to people who are in crisis. Um, and so to that end, I have already started uh, engaging with stakeholders around the state uh, to begin the conversation of envisioning what it is, we, how, how do we want this to look for our state? Uh, there are as many, as many people on this call or watching, there are that many models and 10 times more across the country as to how law enforcement works with mental health providers uh, and peers uh, and EMTs uh, to respond to people in crisis. And so what we need to figure out and what the commissioners charged me with doing is helping to lead the Department of Public Safety in figuring out what can that look like from a statewide model uh, for, for you know, the Department of Public Safety. Uh, there are models, as this uh, committee may be aware, of uh, um, the community outreach uh, program in Burlington through the Howard Center uh, <clears throat> is a, a tremendous model that uh, has some national recognition uh, and growing uh, numbers that show incredible support for its work. Uh, there are individual embedded workers in uh, a number of places in local law enforcement. There are uh, CIT models, uh, crisis intervention team uh, models that uh, a few law enforcement agencies have taken on as their model uh, for training their officers. Um, and working with uh, community providers. Uh, there are, uh, there's a model out of Eugene, Oregon called CAHOOTS that I know that the folks in Burlington and DMH are, are looking at. And what we need to do is really take a look at what's going to work for our state. Uh, I think the CAHOOTS model is a great model. However, I don't think that model is necessarily something that's going to work well in our extremely rural areas. Uh, it will work much better in kind of our more populous uh, pockets uh, within Vermont, but we really need to look at, of all these different models, what's going to work best. And it may not be that there's one model that covers the state, because I think Vermont is, is unique in that sense, uh, similar to, to some other states, but we have pockets of metropolitan-esque areas uh, and very rural areas that have very different needs very different uh, resources available to them. And so we need to take a look at what's going to work for our state. And so when I began doing this work, I started with individual conversations with uh, uh, many of the various stakeholders. And so I have already had uh, and begun conversations with uh, individuals from NAMI, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, Disability Rights Vermont, Mad Freedom, uh, Green Mountain Self-Advocacy, Vermont Federation for Families with Children with Mental Health Needs, Vermont Family Network, Department of Aging and Independent Living, uh, ADAP. Uh, I've talked with uh, Monica Hutt, the Chief Prevention Officer, uh, Vermont Center for Independent Living, and I can continue. Uh, and these are all the individuals that I have started to have these conversations because I feel and we feel that these are folks who are uh, stakeholders who uh, will have valuable input as to what the needs are uh, of our communities and to help us guide where we go forward uh, as to what, what a statewide system uh, looks, looks at. Now, I know that my responsibilities uh, in the Department of Public Safety are with fire, EMS, and the state police. Uh, I do not have purview over 
uh, and the Department of Public Safety does not have purview over local law enforcement, uh, sheriffs, uh, you know, university police, things of that sort. Uh, nor do we have oversight of the the uh, police academy. Uh, and so my work is focusing on how will fire EMS uh, and the state police interact together going forward. Uh, and so in relation to S197, while I am in full agreement of the need uh, of, of this work and, and such uh, plainly because it's the job that was created uh, <laughs> and that I, I, I took on because this is such important work. Uh, and you know, for those of you who, who know any of my history, I have you know, an extensive history of working at that intersection of mental health and, and criminal justice systems. Uh, and so this is uh, a passionate uh, piece of work for me uh, to continue doing this. I think that S197, uh, the the intent behind it is exemplary, uh, and we need more uh, focus on our mental health system and how we respond to people in crisis. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not sure if we need a study group uh, per se that's legislatively mandated, uh, uh, partly because I've already started that process. Um, and you know, I've, I've already started to engage with these individuals. I do not necessarily intend to have a two dozen member uh, work group. Um, I've done enough work groups uh, uh, working for the state that I know that a 24 member work group will come back to the legislature with a report of absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, but this needs to start with this large of a group to get all that information and bring all that stakeholder input in while then we pare down to a smaller subgroup from this group uh, to really do a deeper dive into what's going to work for our state. Uh, and so I think that if there was something that I would be coming out for and ask for uh, to help with my work in doing this, uh, especially on, on how uh, Department of Public Safety can respond to people in crisis, uh, would be that if there was the availability of a, uh, a national consultant or someone else who has, you know, maybe helped set up uh, uh, the CAHOOTS program or the Denver Star program or programs in Albuquerque, and I could, you know, the list goes on, um, you know, the uh, Bureau of Justice uh, has technical assistance and just other, other folks that there's, there's just such a, there's a lot of work in this area right now going on across the country and across the globe. Uh, and I think it would be um, unfortunate if we don't uh, take the opportunity to access some of that uh, other work. I consider myself uh, a real good person in this area. Uh, I consider myself somewhat of a subject matter expert. Uh, however, I would never consider myself to be, the, I haven't set up these programs before. There are others who have. I've researched them. I know how they look. I know how they work, but I haven't done the actual work. There are others who have. And to be able to access and, and uh, work with someone uh, that can work with our stakeholders to be able to report back to the legislature and uh, the governor uh, as to what we feel would work for Vermont uh, would be the, the position and the direction that I, I'd like to see this, this work going. And I will pause there. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Morning. And if you could please get um, some testimony in writing, we'd greatly appreciate it. I know that yep. you and I have talked about this previously. And uh, obviously the public safety issue is... Uh, just one piece of the whole mental health um, concerns that we have in the state. And it, and, but every time uh, one, one piece of the state starts working with the DAs and the SSAs or the primary care folks, uh, fo care folks, it might detract from another section. So as public safety is building a number of mental health counselors within the barracks, what does that mean for the availability of mental health counselors in schools or other uh, organizations? So the need for coordination, this, as I said in our first meeting on this bill, um, my experience with what happened to the EMT in the Northeast Kingdom and the response and the lack of coordinated uh, response was, is, is key. So the, I have no qualms about the great work that you are doing. It's just outstanding. And we need to have that work continue within public safety. I think our goal here 
is to sort out how to bring all the little all the silos together and across um, medical and social uh, response and public safety response. So uh, we'll we'll continue thinking about this. And if there are specific recommendations that you can make that we might include legislatively, that would be helpful. You know, we want our goal certainly is to go beyond the working group, but um, we're hearing that working group might be also helpful. So thank you. Senator Hardy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Morning, uh, or Mr. Fox. Um, doctor, doc, are you a doctor? <laughs> I wish I was. I'd get okay. paid a lot more. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I hear you. Um, well, thank you for your testimony. And um, I appreciated that you, your comments about how a uh, working group was probably not necessary, actually. Um, and the I, I think we need to, we're in crisis right now, and we need to find solutions that are going to help right now. Getting 24 people around a table is not going to help right now. <laughs> um, I'm also somewhat skeptical of, of consultants. Um, however, they can be helpful if you're talking about a specific area. So I was intrigued by your um, uh, suggestion of a consultant who might be able to help you implement some kind of national best practices model for integrating mental health into law enforcement. And if you could flesh that out a little bit more, I would, I would really appreciate that. Um, that seems like a more immediate solution to a problem that you're already working on and coordinating across a lot of people. My I have a question though, which um, I'm sure I'm not unique in that I'm hearing from people on the ground in my community um, who are local mental health providers and local law enforcement. So not state police, not people at, not state mental health workers, but the DAs and my local police departments are having a really hard time coordinating and staffing and responding in a collaborative and helpful way to a crisis like you uh, described at the beginning of your testimony. And I'm wondering how your work can, or if your work can help with those kinds of situations at the very local level, or what do you recommend to us to help with that situation? Well, thank you. Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think you're not alone um, in, in hearing the that, that kind of response that there's, been maybe an increase in difficulty and coordination between law enforcement, local law enforcement, and uh, mental health agencies, particularly when we're talking about, you know, coordination around a crisis uh, type work. Uh, you know, I think with the um, implementation of the statewide use of force policy um, at the end of last calendar year, uh, I think what we're witnessing is uh, um, kind of the ripple effects of people responding to that. Um, you know, I think, you know, yes, it's true that all law enforcement agencies, both municipal, local, as well as state police, have all adopted the, the uh, statewide use of force policy. Um, but I think some of the interpretation uh, is different. Each department has, you know, different attorneys and different attorneys interpret things differently. And so we're getting, there's much different responses in different areas. Um, I have been pulled into some conversations when some of that coordination issues uh, relate to with state police um, and, uh, and been involved in those conversations. And I've had some conversations with uh, some of the partners at the designated agencies uh, and emergency services uh, just around the use of force policy and, and uh, its impacts. Uh, one of the things we've done is we had uh, uh, some of the folks who did the training for law enforcement across the state. Uh, on the use of force policy, uh, present uh, that information to the emergency services directors and uh, the executive directors of the designated agencies, um, and also had them do uh, that same training for the mental health crisis specialists who are now embedded in the state police barracks. Uh, the goal of that is to try and help everyone to understand this is the information that everyone's being provided with. Here's kind of what some of the concerns are from the mental health side. Here are some of the concerns from the law enforcement side and how do we kind of bridge that gap uh, in the middle? And I think what we're experiencing now are the growing pains uh, of 
So, so what is the limit? Uh, you know, it used to be clear. I feel unsafe. You, I call you, you go. Uh, now it's not so clear anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, I feel safe. So I, I call you to go and it's like, well, but they're not danger to anyone else. And so how does that, you know, should law enforcement even be involved in this and, you know, things of that sort. And so I think, you know, I think what we're experiencing in, in, in your community and others is the growing pains uh, of that. But I think the way we get through that is that these types of conversations that I've been involved in uh, with the local agencies and the local law enforcement or the barracks uh, to have a better understanding. And in each place where I've been involved with that, it seems to improve as we start to have those conversations more. Uh, and, uh, gonna, I'm, I th thank you. Um, yeah. that, that's pretty comprehensive. If you could just add perhaps something to your testimony. Sure. And this is exactly why we're sitting here today. Uh, we have felt stressed out about a lack of coordination and leadership. And it isn't about your leadership for public safety. It's about the overall system. So we are looking at a more holistic uh, vision and how to improve our mental health infrastructure and response. So the, we're, we're going to have to move on, uh, but thank you, Morning, for being here. And I know, sure. thank you also for the work that you're doing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's terrific. Uh, so we're going to move on to uh, Lynn Coda, who is here. And Lynn, why don't you um, introduce yourself for the record? And I will share with folks that Lynn has appeared in the Education Committee uh, unfortunately, we were unable to hear all of her testimony and her slides, but I think what she has to say about schools is significant to our conversation in um, health and welfare. So Lynn, welcome. Thank Please you, introduce yourself and we'll listen to your testimony. My name is Lynn Coda. I'm the superintendent of schools for the Franklin Northeast Supervisory Union. So I appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you today. I am I'm wondering if I could possibly share my screen, Madam Chair. Yep. Lit, uh, Aaron, can you? Um, yep, you yeah. can. There you go. OK. Do you see the slide? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, so I, I want to speak with the committee today around the about the mental health crisis that we're seeing in Vermont schools, and I'd also like to speak in favor of uh, S197. So today I'm going to be giving you the perspective of the public school system that is supporting the youth you've been hearing about this morning for seven to 10 hours each day. So we're on the ground, uh, really able to give you insights about what this looks like uh, within our school systems. So in having conversations uh, with colleagues around the state and in the Champlain Valley, we were seeing an increased need for mental health services prior to the pandemic. And after the pandemic, we started to see more significant needs, more students having mental health challenges. Um, and then what was even more concerning to us than the number, it was the magnitude and the complexity of what those needs um, were and the resulting behavioral manifestations of those needs. Um, we're feeling like some of those um, some of those needs are starting to overwhelm our capacity and our expertise uh, within the school system to be able to provide that level of support that these children need within public schools. So it, it definitely you'll hear some things from me today that will mirror some of the things you've heard from from other people who have spoken with you today. Um, I'm gonna give you some of the details that we see from the education perspective. So in reflecting on some of the challenges that we faced, like I said, not just in Franklin Northeast, but across the state, some patterns have emerged in terms of some of the things we're seeing with students. We're seeing um, more violent outbursts in episodes of vandalism with our students. Um, we're seeing more sexualized behaviors in students in pre-K through 12th grade. We're seeing more significant disruption, uh, more defiance. Uh, we're seeing eloping students running away from schools. Um, and we're seeing increased threats of harm to self and others, which I think you also heard about today. Uh, the complexity of these behaviors and of these, uh, for these students is really putting tremendous pressure on our capacity to serve them well in our schools. 
So right at the moment when we have a need for more intensive services and more therapeutic interventions more than ever, the resources that are available to support these students and families are, are inadequate as you've heard today, not by anyone else's fault. It's just the increase in demand is outpacing the level of resources that we have within the state. So schools are really right now serving children in the general education system who are exhibiting behaviors and mental health challenges that far exceed anything that we would have previously considered manageable while within the context of the least restrictive general education environment. So um, one of the things that we've noticed is this, this higher demand for the mental health services throughout the state has resulted in wait lists, which you, I won't spend a lot of time on some of these pieces because you've already heard about it. We're experiencing lengthy wait lists for our youth and we're, we're seeing families experience lengthy wait lists um, for, for family-based services as well. We're hearing from our mental health partners that they're really struggling with staffing shortages um, and they have vacancies in some programs that are up to, you know, if up to 50% staffing shortages in some programs and the school-based programs that we typically partner with them on. Um, our local DA communicated that they had about 37% of their positions that were unfilled um, at the moment. We also are seeing patterns um, since we've returned to more in-person learning after the pandemic of an increase in DCF referrals around the state and also reports from our local um, human services department of children and families that their workforce shortage has been substantial as well. At one point in time, um, when we had more restrictions about being in person than we do right now, their, their staffing shortage was around 49% of the positions were not filled at one point. So we know that through the pandemic, the Department of Children and Families had barriers to being able to support families and students and children in their homes. And there was a period of time where students were really unseen by educators because they were experiencing you know, going through the pandemic and not having access to in-person learning. So as a result, um, what we're seeing is that some children have experienced more trauma as a result of that. Um, they have, they're experiencing the effects of deteriorating mental health um, in adults that they're, um, they're connected with and increases in domestic violence and substance use are also having an impact on, on our students. One of the things that we're also seeing is that when our students get to the point where they need more intensive services and we start to look outside of our school systems for support, uh, the wait lists are incredible. You heard about this from Dr. Ashley earlier today. We had um, have an example of an 11 year old spending 11 days in an emergency department waiting for a bed to open up at the Brattleboro retreat um, and so it definitely can relate to everything that, that she shared with you about that today. We're also seeing, you know, when children need placements in alternative schools that can provide more therapeutic and intensive interventions, we have wait lists for those programs that are a year or more to get children into those programs. And then sometimes when we do get to the place where we're ready to enroll a student in that program, we sometimes are hearing their needs exceed what that alternative placement can provide. So that presents additional challenges for us because then when we're faced with those situations where there are no more intensive services that are available for our students, our school teams then are left to develop programming to, to meet those intensive needs without the expertise and the resources to do so. And Senator Lyons, I heard you asked a question earlier about the impact of us building capacity within each of our silos. And I've been really interacting that with that in my mind because in the absence of outside resources, school systems are really forced at this point to build their internal capacity. So I think if you were to study how much mental health services are being provided in schools, we're doing our best to create what we can internally because we don't feel like we have a choice in terms of the response. But I think about that, the silo analogy, uh, we're doing that and then that's having a direct negative impact on our DAs because we're all pulling from the same, same um, staffing pool. So I think that I'm really interested in the coordinated effort idea because everyone's working as hard as they can, but within their own silo. So I think that there's, there's definitely um, a need for us to 
to work together better because I don't think it's it's humanly possible for any of us to work any harder than we're working. So I'm interested in the coordination of these efforts. Just a little, I've, I've already stated this, just these are three of the big challenges we're seeing in terms of um, our experiences of our students and our families, adult mental health, substance use, and domestic violence. And one of the things that um, Maslow has taught us about hi hierarchy of need um, is that students are much less likely to excel academically if their basic human needs are not being met. So I just want to acknowledge that I feel like Vermont is really on the right track with some of the state level priorities that are in place, uh, cre creating more equitable access to basic needs for Vermont families around affordable housing, food insecurity, high quality childcare, broadband access, et cetera. So, I think that's really important to not lose sight of how important those efforts are. So I think one of the things I would really like this committee to hear is that the, the pandemic has really rocked the foundation that supports students in our public schools. And we rely upon our partners in those outside agencies, the DAs, the mental health services, the um, primary care, we rely on Department of Children and Families. And when there are limited resources in any of those areas. Our students are going without um, getting their, their needs met and that is having an impact on their experiences in, in our schools. And so um, foundationally there's work that we need to do in order to be able to better support our students. So some of the things just thinking through um, how could we improve, improve, improve this um, and improve outcomes for our students is really allow schools the opportunity, the time and the space to focus on the priorities they have right in front of them without adding any new initiatives right now. And in my mind, the best way to support our public schools is to really focus on supporting the very systems that our schools rely upon to support children and families in crisis. So health, human services, local mental health, um, and intensive therapeutic programs, both residential and day treatment. So. In conclusion, I just want to say that I, I do support S197 and the development of that coordinated mental health crisis working group. I would encourage you to, to consider if there is an opportunity or should there be an opportunity for education to be at the table when talking through um, the coordinated effort part of this work. Um, and I would also ask that the legislature consider uh, prioritizing providing financial resources to address the staffing shortages and the salary inequities that exist in human services and mental health fields. I heard one of the uh, people who spoke earlier this morning about you know, really having a hard time recruiting people to Vermont because of the pay inequities. I would ask that you continue to prioritize investments intended to address those basic needs of our Vermont children and families, uh, provide targeted and increased funding support for mental health services to address those intensifying complexity of needs for children and families, and really work to expand access to the day and the inpatient therapeutic programs for Vermont and families in crisis. Um, so I it just, I think I've already said, I don't think that any of, any of the silos, any of the parts of our system can work harder. I hope that the coordinated effort that you're, you're talking about can really help us all to be working smarter. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and I welcome any questions or comments that you might have. All right, Lynn, thank you. Um, we're very appreciative of the time you've taken to bring us this information and I hope that you um, and maybe some of your colleagues will be available as we go forward with the discussion. So at this point, we're simply gathering data, information and thinking through what steps come next. I, I will say just one comment because I, I know we don't want comments today, but it's really a question I think for us to think about. And that is the, the, the salary comparison between the DAs, public safety, uh, mental health counselors, uh, primary care, nurse practitioners who've been invited in as, um, as mental health practitioners, and then folks who are in school. So uh, obviously salary has continues to be a big barrier along the way. So I'm glad you brought that up. Senator Cummings, question. I'm muted. Um, just one question. 
we hear schools got a whole lot of ESSER funds. Uh, we hear, but we don't know and we don't know where they're going. I'm just wondering, what's the Department of Education doing for you, if anything? In, could you be a little more specific? In, in, um, in the area of, we know as kids come back in, everything that you laid out, it was bad before the pandemic. Now we've got kids that had, you know, relatively supportive home lives who have had their whole education disrupted. Plus we have kids who had some challenging home lives have been closed up with those challenging home lives. And we know there's going to be support and treatment necessary to help those students succeed. And I'm just wondering, has the state offered you anything, acknowledged the problem? I mean, what are you hearing from us? I definitely think there's an acknowledgement of the problem and there are, it, it isn't that we don't have the financial resources to be able to, to pull some of these things uh, into our system and that's exactly what we're doing with some of the pandemic uh, response money. I think the challenge is we have been still working on navigating the pandemic in real time. So that shift to moving us into a pandemic recovery mode has been delayed because we're still responding in real time. So they definitely know that that is one of our big priorities on the ground is the mental health needs of our, our students within the system. Um, and you know we've talked about that becoming a, a real priority throughout the state. I don't think that um, we have seen enough yet in terms of, of support. And I, and I think, I just wanna caution because I, I think it's more than the department, the agency of education. I think it is all of us as we talked today okay. because we could work really hard and we could build those systems of supports within our school, but then they're disconnected from all of those other parts of the system. So when students are in crisis at home and they get seen in the ER by the primary care physicians, it's pretty likely that they're in crisis at school. So if, if education isn't working with all of those other agencies, we're really not gonna impact change on that child because we're the ones that we have them seven to 10 hours every single day. So I think there, to, to answer your question, I think there's more work we could do as a system in the state. And I'm hopeful that, that that work will become a priority as we get out of the responding to pandemic mode. It sounds like everybody would like to coordinate and we can coordinate as far as getting people into the emergency rooms, but we don't have the resources to get them out. We don't have the resources to intervene on a regular enough basis to prevent emergency rooms. And so the challenge is to figure out how to do that. It, it, it I see you grinning, bottom. Senator Lyons, I know, <laughs> but they no. won't let me raise taxes. <laughs> no, well, we're, we're, we're gonna work on this. And uh, we, I'm sorry to say we, we need to move on. Um, I know everyone wants to make a comment and to have a discussion and, that means we're we're headed in a direction that's important to each of us. So, uh, Lynn, thank you again, and please uh, stay available as we go forward. Um, your information is always very helpful. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right. So uh, we.